covering. We believe that. So, all right. You love God, right? We got that straight. I'm going to start a kind of a two-part series today um, called Positioning positioning for Blessing. And uh, what if there were certain things that we could do? What if there were certain things that we could do that would that would enhance or would possibly bring the, the blessings of God in our life. Do you believe that there are? I do. I think that there's things that, there's things that we can do. There's a, a, this great book was written by uh, Pastor Robert Moore. It's called The Blessed Life. If you've never read this book, it's a book that you, you need to get. It's a great book. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. We've, we've actually, I've taught from this book here. We've actually showed his videos on Sunday morning here. And I don't normally do that, but it was just, it's so good that, uh, that we did that. So it's a, it's a, it's a great book, but, uh, but basically it's the, it's the, it's the keys is what it says here, unlocking the rewards of generous living. It's a book about, uh, the blessed life is a, is a generous, is a generous life, but that certainly isn't the key to all the blessings of God, is it? It's not, um, Earlier this week, a good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Doug Brady, who's been here several times, uh, ministered for us in our church. I've been to his church. Uh, we're great friends. Uh, he sent me a Devo that he did, uh, that he sent out, uh, and it was called A Blessed Life. And uh, so, you know, I, I got to thinking about, you know, A Blessed Life, and then Pastor Robert Book, The Blessed Life. And then, of course, you know, Monday, you know, I'm kind of getting get my my direction that I'm going. I'd finished the last series that we, di- that we did. And um, so, but I, and I just couldn't get away from this. And so as, as I was praying about the direction, because remember, I'm a, burden, I'm a burden pastor. What God lays on my heart is, is, is what I speak. I don't, I'm not planning eight months out or six months out or three months out or two weeks out, whatever the Lord lays on my heart for, for that time. And so I just was praying about it, and I just couldn't get away from this, this thing about, about the blessed life. So my mind just kind of stayed there. So I want to talk about ways that we can, that we can walk in the, in the blessings of God. Again, of course, we can't earn our way to heaven. Uh, but we can position ourselves in that right to receive what Jesus Christ has freely given to us by his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. Isn't that right? So again, so that's, that, that's important. Um, so let's look at, at something here in Psalms 34. Psalms 34, if you have a Bible, you might want to turn there. I'd like to carry a Bible that I could mark in, or if you don't have that, click to it. Click to Psalms, 130, or Psalms 34. All these scriptures will be up on the on the screen today. I think all of them will. If not, they're in our app, our, our CityGate app. They're also on the U version. And so make sure you follow along. And as the Spirit of God speaks to you, says something, draws something to it, you may, mm, I don't know what it is, but God's just really standing that, speaking that to me today. So make sure that you uh, underline some things and write yourself some notes. Psalms 34, verse 1. You're there? I talked there for just a little bit, giving you time to get there. It's kind of a little game we do, you know. Verse one says this, says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. I will boast only in the Lord. I will boast only in the Lord. Isn't that good? I won't boast about myself. I'll boast only in the Lord. Let all all who are helpless take heart. Verse three says, come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I pray to the Lord and he answered me, he freed me from all of my fears. Now listen, if you're a person that's given over to fear, and there are people, there are a lot of Christians that are given over into the area of fear, this verse is a great prescription to help you overcome that. Did you hear me? I said, this verse is a great scripture. It's a great prescription. And remember the Bible says in Proverbs chapter four, verse 20, incline your ear into my sayings, let them not depart from your heart. And then verse 22 says, God's word is health to all of your flesh. And we could, we could imp- take that word health and say medicine, and it wouldn't do anything but enhance what that scripture says. God's word is medicine to all of our flesh. God's word is super vitamins to all of our flesh. And again, look at those verses. Look at some of those, those key things in that Psalms 34 that we just read. The verse one says, I will constantly speak his praises. The, third, the, the first part of verse three says this, come, let us exalt or let us tell others of his greatness. And verse, the last part of verse three says, exalt his name together. Remember, we're better together. Let's exalt his name together. We're talking about invoking the blessings of God in our life. And so what's the result of doing those things? Verse four says this, he freed me from all of my fears. 
He feed, freed me from all of my fears. So what I see here in Psalms, Psalms 34, verses 1 through 4 there, and let's call this our, our number one key. The number one key is this, create the right environment. Create the right environment, or another way we could say that is create the right atmosphere. Did you know that you can create an atmosphere where the presence of God is welcomed, where the presence of God is invited? The Bible says in Psalms uh, 22, verse 3, but thou, o, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. We know that better translation today is God inhabits what? The praises of his people. God inhabits, God comes to dwell then, comes to inhabit the praises of his people. You know, emotions sometimes, a lot of times can create an atmosphere. Isn't that right? You ever, you ever walked into a, in, into a room and people were grieving? People were sad and there's just, there's an atmosphere of, of, of grief and, and sad. And there's, there's times and you can walk in and there's, there's people are exuberant and they're happy and they're joyful. They're, they're, they're again, they're ecstatic. When someone is, um, when sometimes there's, there's strife, there's strife in a room and not necessarily when you walk in and some people are fighting, but you walk in and you just know there's, there's strife in here. I remember one pastor talking about that he and his wife went to, went to visit uh, a family and they had, boy, they were at a knockdown drag out. And then all of a sudden, they, when they saw the preacher come and they opened the door and, and hey, pastor so-and-so, you know, it's good to see you. And his wife said, you know, when they went back in the, to, to the back room to, to get something, I think went into the kitchen to get something to bring some, some refreshments out. His wife said to the pastor, she said, there's been harsh words spoken in this room. She said, I can feel it in here. And you can, you can feel strife like that in a, in a room. So, and what about fear? What about, the, again, if it's emotion, what about, what about fear? And it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy when it causes us to not to obey God, what he's calling us to do. You know, sometimes, you know, like I don't have a fear of electricity, but I have a healthy respect. Amen. I'm not with electricity, but I respect it. You know, I don't, you know, if I was standing before a, a, an, an elephant, a male elephant and there are female elephants all around him are in heat and stuff. And man, he's, he's roaring and thick up dust. I'm not just going to, hey, big buddy, what are you doing? You know, I am not fearful of him, but I respect him. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times though, but people allow fear to cause them to not do what God's calling them and what God is leading them to do. 27 times, 27 to 39 times. And the reason there's that variance between, I mean, that's a, that's a big difference there. Uh, it's, it's, it depends on what translation of the Bible that you read. The Bible says, fear not, 29 to, to 37 times. Some translations say it's 39 times. And then when you add in uh, the phrase, do not be afraid, that number goes up uh, exponentially. But listen, we can create an atmosphere. We can create an environment that draws the presence of God, that draws the blessings of God. For example, an attitude of gratitude an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of appreciation for all the things that God has done for us. You may recall uh, King Saul uh, when he, um, he offered the sacrifice, uh, that something that the priest was supposed to do, Samuel the priest was supposed to do that, and he was delayed in his coming. So Saul was kind of getting nervous because they were fixing to go to battle, and he says, I'm going to go ahead and offer this sacrifice. That was it. He stepped way out of his call. He stepped way upon, beyond what he was um, supposed to you know, supposed to be doing and uh and so that's when uh he told Samuel that, that today I've, I've removed Saul removed the anointing from Saul to be king and then God would release and the way that that's translated is almost in a in a uh, causative sense but it was in a really should be translated in a permissive sense God permitted an evil spirit uh to come on Saul at times and it would drive him crazy, be severely depressed. And, um, and, and he would call for a harpist who would be David to come and to play uh, praise music and, and worship. And it would, it would ease that and it would cause that spirit to lift off of, off of Saul. So again, we see that the, the environment or the, the spiritual environment, the atmosphere around you is a determinism in the manifested presence and the blessings of God in our lives. I want you just to stop for just a moment, maybe even give it some thought, maybe later past today, but think about it this week. Think about this. What's the atmosphere around your life? What's the atmosphere in your home? What's the atmosphere in where you work at? You know, one, uh, one of these survival shows that Paul and I watch, uh, there was this one guy and he just couldn't get along with anybody. 
I mean, nobody liked this guy. And uh, finally, the two people that he was with, they, man, they said, dude, go, go do your own thing. We're, we're just going to, we're going to, we'll, we'll survive here. And he's, you know, they're kind of interviewing him. You know, you know, how they take these things. And he's going, you know, this is the way it always happens to me. Everywhere I go, I just get pushed out. It's like, dude, do you think, can, you, can we find a common denominator in this problem? And that common denominator is him. It seems like wherever he goes, he pushes, he repels people. He repels them away. Think about the people in your life that are around you throughout the day. Do they help invite the presence of God or do they repel the presence of God? Listen, you can often change the environment that you're in. You know, sometimes you, you, you work in an office and people are going in and but you know, sometimes, you know, with your uh, personality, it can be just, man, you're that kind of a bubbly type, type person. You can bring the temperature up. You can increase and, and improve the atmosphere. And sometimes just because of the, the reason of the anointing that's on your life, you can change an atmosphere. You can change the environment because of that, but it doesn't always work. It didn't work for Jesus in his own hometown. Remember in Mark chapter six, it says he went back to Nazareth and he says, because there was an environment, there was an atmosphere there of what? Of unbelief. It says that he could there do no mighty works. Say that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them of a few minor things. But listen, the purpose, purpose in your heart, in your, in your heart, Wherever your environment that you're in, again, to, would that be in your home, to create an environment that welcomes the presence of God, that welcomes and encourages and, and uh, that just, again, it welcomes and it honors his presence. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm, during the week, when I'm preparing for, for Sunday, I'll, uh, I'll put on worship music in my office, sometimes with words and sometimes just instrumental. And I find sometimes I'll be thinking about the words that, in the song and so I just put on some instrumental music and I just feel, I'm trying to create an atmosphere of praise that invites the presence of God in there as I, again, as I'm studying. The second thing, number two, point number two is this, um, this create, and this very closely rela- related to the environment is having the right energy power, having the right uh, energy source, we could say. You know, all of us, uh, it, some point in our Christian life, we have a fleshly battle. And some of those battles continue on for a long time. And we, you know, we have to crucify that flesh. When you got born again, what part of you got born again? If you're a spirit, a soul, and a body, which one, which one, of, which one of you got saved? Which part of you got saved? Anybody know? Your spirit man. Your spirit man got born again. Your flesh didn't get saved. And so your, 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 your spirit gets saved and we're to do something with our mind, our mind, our, our mind, our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And anybody know what we're supposed to do with that? According to Romans 12 too, be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we're to do something with our mind and in our flesh, we have to reckon that old sinful nature as dead. That's what Paul said. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I still live but the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we have to crucify that old sinful nature. When you got born again, all of a sudden you just want to start doing everything right. You still have that old sin nature that you got to deal with and you crucify it. And sometimes that old flesh will lie dead and dormant for a while and then it'll, it'll, creep, back, it'll creep back in. You know, when I, was, when I was a little kid, I stole. I was a stealer. I mean, I, wasn't a, I, I, I didn't... Uh, I wasn't like, uh, in, didn't have any mug shots or anything like that, but I'd steal baseball cards from the store. I had a cousin that played professional football for the Atlanta Falcons, and I was stealing the cards for him. I was trying to find his card on there. Now, of course, I'm just making that up. I was trying to find the things for myself. But, you know, I, I would steal that, uh, steal things like that. And then, uh, but today, praise God, I don't steal baseball cards anymore. Let's just lift our hands and thank the Lord. And praise God for his goodness. <laughs> There's, that is one thing that is, that is there. now I am, because, you know, when you, when you used to, if you used to be a safe cracker, you know, or something like that, or you used to be a, a burglar like that, uh, and you got saved and you got redeemed, you might still think about stealing, but, but, but you wouldn't, right? Now, I might have a thought about stealing something or taking something. Please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I thought the enemy the enemy tries to, brings, brings a thought like that. Say, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The other day we were out playing golf and I rolled up on the first, came up to the, after our drive went up to the, to the green, right off the green was a nice, I mean, it was a nice um, uh, Yeti cooler. It was a uh, mug, not a mug thing. It was a, what do they call them? Thermos. It was a Yeti thermos. It was nice. When I picked it, it was still warm. And I thought, man, this is nice. 
wonder who, wonder who would have dropped this. Well, they just forced them. They just left, you know, playing fun. And they were all older gentlemen. And it looked like it has been from the Civil War, but it was still in real good shape. And I thought, man, I'd like to have this. But after the, after the run, when we got to the clubhouse, I went into the, went into the clubhouse and turned in. Hey, somebody left. That. They said, man, somebody ought to be missing that. And I said, yeah, I know they ought to be missing it. But again, <clears throat> the thought was there to take that and keep that and put it in my 50 Yetis that I have in our house. But I couldn't. That wasn't mine. So what I'm saying is that, that's one thing that, that, that the enemy could throw a thought to keep something or do something like that. But it's not, it's not a temptation. That, that part of me has been crucified. But there may be another area in my life. Murder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I better go on before I get in trouble. Paula said amen. Listen, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if God would provide us with some kind of a supernatural energy or a supernatural power source? Wouldn't it be nice if he did? Right? He did, Right? He did that. It's called the Holy Spirit. And Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit over and over and over as he, especially as in in his last year and a half of ministry, as he was getting his disciples geared up and ready to to understand that he was going to be crucified and that they were going to take on the ministry and carry it on. Um, He said this in John chapter 7 says, he that believeth in me, this is Jesus talking, as the scripture has saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, but this he spake of the spirit, which uh, they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And again, remember where this was, this is in John chapter 7. Jesus, again, is talking about the, the spirit. He called him oftentimes the promise, the promise spirit, the promise of, of the Father. And then... Um, in John 20, this is the resurrected Lord Jesus. He is crucified. He's raised from the dead. He's appearing back to his disciples in John chapter 20, verse 21. So Jesus said to them, again, talking to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, all I also send you. So as I have been sent, now I'm sending you, verse 22. And when he said this, he breathed on him. This is the first installment of that promise. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So again, and that's when, that's when they actually got born again. It wasn't on the day of Pentecost, as some people say. They got born again there because they received the Spirit. Jesus had said up to this point earlier, the Spirit has been with you on that day, and this is that day he will be in you. They received the Holy Spirit. I liken it to when, when God created Adam and Eve, when he created Adam and he breathed on him, and Adam became a living being. When Jesus breathed on them, their spirit got born again. So again, then 10 days later, and remember he just said, he just said there, he says, as the father has sent me, so I'm sending you. But he didn't breathe on them and say, go. He said, go. He said, he, they got filled with the Holy Spirit as far as when he came on, to live on the inside of them. And then he said, wait for the promise of the father. Go and wait for Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. So 10 days later, the day of Pentecost, the second installment of this promise came, Acts 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Again, it was on, it was on that day that the New Testament gift of tongues was poured out on, on uh, these, the 120 that were in the upper room. And again, the, the second installment was not tongues. Tongues was just uh, was what you would say is a, what's the word? Um, an initial evidence of the, the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were baptized with power to what? To be witnesses, not just to speak in tongues. Again, that's just, that's the benefit. They've received a prayer language. You know, there's people that say, well, I, I don't believe in that. You know, there may be somebody you that are watching online today. You're saying, I don't, I don't believe in that. Well, if you don't believe in that, then there's a whole lot of other part of the Bible that you're going to have to mark out that you don't believe probably you'd have to go mark out 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, New American Standard says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may, that you may uh, prophesy. For one who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but unto God. For no one understands, watch this, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. I want you to think about that for just a moment. It says, notice that, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. That means that people that are around you, that are praying with you, they don't understand a word that you're saying when you're praying in tongues. You don't even understand what you're saying when you pray in tongues. Isn't that something? But here's the best news is the devil doesn't understand what you're praying. 
when you're praying, when you're praying in tongues. How many of you have ever heard the story about something called, it was during World War II, it was called the Navajo Code Walkers. The Navajo, Navajo code, code Talkers, or it's called the Wind Talkers. What that was, was in World War II, the, the Americans were having, having a difficulty overcoming and, and winning against the Japanese because the Japanese were able to intercept their radio transmissions. And so all of their military tactics and their, their plans, what they were gonna do was, was, was made known to them. And the, the military enlisted the help of uh, the Navajo tribe and uh, they, uh, these Indians and they had, they had a language, this group of Indians, they had a language that was not, it was not printed. They only knew it. So they enlisted 29 of them and they got them to talk, give uh, Navajo words for certain tactics. And they were able to later, that was really the resulting in helping the Americans defeat the Japanese during, during World War II. So look again at that verse, that verse, uh, verse two, it says this, but we speak mysteries unto God and our enemy, the devil, Again, he doesn't have a clue. He has no clue, again, what we're saying. How many of you ever found yourself in a situation that you didn't know how to pray? You know, you just kind of, you just, you just, you just kind of pray what you think is right and, and you pray all that you know to pray and you just kind of feel like that there's, there's just something else that I should do. Praise God, the Bible says in Romans chapter eight, verse 26, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for, for us with groanings too deep for words. And he does that through us. Praise God, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire. And again, it comes with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And for people that don't believe in that, you're, you are, you are um, handicapping yourself because of, again, these things that, that God has given. Think about the implications of that. What is Jesus's today? What is his present day ministry? The Bible tells us that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you. That's in heaven, that's going on in heaven. Down here on the earth, the Holy Spirit on earth is praying through you. That's awesome. <clears throat> so again, we're talking about having the right power, <clears throat> the right power source, the right, the right energy source. Jude, verse 20, there's only one chapter, so it's Jude, verse 20. But to you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith, make progress like, a, like an edifice. An edifice is, is a structure or like a building, like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it's, it, you can literally see buildings like these apartment complexes all around that they're building. They're just, man, these edifices, man, they're going up. Seems like they go up in three weeks. I mean, they're, they're building, they're going up. And when we pray in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says we build our spirit man up. We're building our spirit man up like that. Uh, there may be some of you, some of you thinking again that, that this, this, is, this stuff may be new to you. And especially some of you maybe that are listening online, this may be new and uh, this is a little bit, little bit kind of weird for you. Um, this, this, all this talk about secret language and stuff like this, but listen, you better pay attention because there's a reason, there's a reason that God, you know, the steps of a, of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And whether you're, you're in, this, in this building or you're, you're online and this is something that you struggle with, God led you here for a reason, amen? amen? And uh, God knew that we taught and believed this part about the Bible. So don't discount it. Open your heart up to it. God's wanting to show you something, do something. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes you know, God is leading us and we're not aware of it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, when we yield our life to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, he becomes not only our Savior, but our Lord. That means our owner, our governor, everything that we have belongs to him. And we commit ourselves to him. God, have your way in me. And that's been a prayer of mine for, for many, many, many years. God, have your way. God, give me the desires. Give me the desires of my heart. And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, uh, I, want a, I, want a, I, want this, I want a Range Rover. That's the desire of my heart. That's not what I'm talking about. God, you give me your desires for my heart. What do you want me to have? That's God giving us the desires of our heart. And, uh, and I remember uh, when I went to Bible college, I, you know, I kind of thought, you know, uh, that, was, that would be a great thing to do. You know, I loved God and kind of felt called to the ministry. So I'm going to go to Bible college. And, and many of you may remember a, a prophecy that I shared with you that was a, it was a monumental personal prophecy that changed my life. And it began, you'll remember this, maybe this brother right back here with the red hair is who I'm talking to. 
that one right there. And then the guy went on, began to, and he was a visiting minister in this particular church that I was going. I was a visitor there and he was a visitor. He'd never seen me before, never knew nothing about me and all of these things. And one of the things he said in there is that you have trusted God right up to the bare wire. And the fact that you are where you are, the fact that you are where you are shows that you trusted God. And again, I don't think he was talking about when he said that. I don't know what he, what he was thinking. The fact that I am where I am in that chair is trusted God. I believe that he meant, what it meant to me was that I was in the Bible school. I was there in that because I had trusted God right to the bare wire. And again, it was not something that I, I, again, that was one of those things that God gave me the desire. God gave me the desire to go to International Bible College. Wasn't, you know, I always thought, well, hey, I, it'll be a good thing to do. I'll just do it. But God led me there. So that's what I mean. Sometimes God will lead us. When we, when we yield it to him, we have to, the, God's given us the desires. We go and we do something. Maybe it's to be involved in an area of ministry. Maybe it's to be involved at the Dream Center, be involved here in, in children's ministry or something. You know, I'll do this. I've just got to, God's put that desire on the inside of you. So again, we need to walk in those things. Get saved, get filled with the Spirit. And then you'll have the right power. You'll have the right energy source Again, to invoke and to bring the blessings of God in our life. So number one, again, is this, being in the right atmosphere by creating it with praise and gratitude and, a, and an attitude of gratitude and, and thanksgiving for all that God does for us. Number two is tap into the right energy source, the right power source, tap into that. And number three, and this is the last one that I'm going to cover today, I want to do, there's about five or six that I want to talk about, but I, do, I wanted to... I want to take my time in going through this and then want to rush through it next week is we have the, the Mother's Day. So I'm going to finish the, the other two or maybe three. I'll finish those the week after Mother's Day. But this is the third point is this, have the right intelligence. Or let me say it this way, have the right, have the right information. When I say have the right intelligence, well, that mean, mean, I mean, I've got to be smart. No, in, intelligence. And when I'm talking about intelligence, every, um, each White House, when there's a new president comes in, they have uh, intel briefing, intelligence briefings, and the military commanders, they have intelligence briefings with the, with the, the president of the United States, and they, they give him kind of what's been going on and where we are and, and things like this. And uh, those intelligence briefings are, are important that they get the right intelligence. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say with that? Remember back when uh, uh, George the Younger, I guess that would be George George W., when he was the president, uh, you know, and they, you know, they went in and invaded uh, Iraq uh, because his, the intelligence said that there was weapons, that Saddam Hussein had uh, uh, chemical weapons. And again, whether they had them or I don't know and you don't know, but he was told that they did. And, you know, again, my, my personal belief, the way I think, I believe that they did have them and they, they got word that they were coming and they were able to hide them well enough. It, again, it, it doesn't matter. But the intelligence apparently uh, wasn't, wasn't good because they went over there and went to war and couldn't find it. So we could say that intelligence wasn't exactly, wasn't exactly right. Um, <clears throat> You gotta make sure that you're getting the right intelligence. You gotta make sure that you're not just getting some narrative that you want to be fed. You know, some people seek after that. They want to, they want to, they feel that what they want to believe, they get information. They seek sources that, that feed them that information. So what's your source? What's your source of knowledge? What's your source of, of intelligence? Because if your source is not good, if your source is not good, you know the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You know, sometimes people, again, they seek sources that feed them the information that they, that they want to believe, and they will create, they will create a worldview with that, with that, with that entail. And what is your worldview? What is your worldview? It's based on something. It's based on the intelligence that you get. Where do you get your intelligence? Well, we get our intel. We'll use that phrase. Well, you get your intel, your knowledge when you're very young from your parents and you start going to school and then you start hanging around friends and then you start you know, getting jobs and you start working with different people and then you go to church. So you're getting a lot of different intel as we grow up in life. And it's important and that begins to form what your worldview is. And I can tell you as a born again Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our worldview should come from the Bible. Not just necessarily from mom and dad or good friends, or teachers, or professors. It should come from the Bible. Especially if, we're, if, our, you know, if our parents weren't you know, faithful to attend church and uh, we weren't raised that way. 
uh, then again, you need to make sure, and you got born again, you need to get your intel and your information, again, from, from the Bible, and that's what, again, should form our worldview. Uh, you know, you could come to church here, you could watch online and listen to the word, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going in because we all face, a lot of times, a lot of distractions. Sometimes, uh, you know, a lot of things can, uh, can distract us. You know, um, uh, you know sometimes a, like a, a, a pastor or somebody that has a, <clears throat> a frog in their throat and they constantly have to clear their throat, it can be very distracting. Amen. Thank you for not saying amen to that. That was a test for you. You, 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 you did good. You know, but some, sometimes a cute little baby can be a distraction. And again, it's, I mean, they're, they're just cute and they're so innocent. And, and you know, you, you might have them in church and, you know, you kind of got them up on your shoulder and they're faced that way and you're talking. And then the people behind you, you don't know this, they're going. Again, it's, it's a distraction from, from the word. That's right. From from birth all the way up through, you know, we have our, our elementary kids. Uh, we have a great, we have great resource to take kids so that parents can come in and be able to receive the word of God, be able to worship the, the Lord without, without distractions. And so we, that's the reason we encourage parents. We don't, we don't, you know, hey, please take your kids out. But again, just for the sake of other people around, we ask people to, you know, we got our great nursing mother's room with wonderful rocking chairs. In fact, I would sit in there today if I you know, if it was a mother, I'd just pretend I'd take a doll and go in there. Those chairs, they, they rock, they're comfortable. They've got a TV, no distractions. <laughs> Paula asked me to make that announcement. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. She didn't. She didn't. Listen. So what, what I was saying is we can be sitting in where we're getting great intelligence but we're not getting it because sometimes we're distracted. I know, I remember when I was at Rama, and uh, Paula was there. We were not married, but we were, we were in some classes together and I was receiving amazing intelligence. Some great knowledge was being passed down from some of the teachers, but I would look over at Paula and I would get distracted because of her beauty. And so we just had to, I just had to turn and face another direction so that, Paula, you, amen. <laughs> You know, sometimes, uh, you ever been doing this? You ever reading a book, getting some good information, getting some good, good knowledge? And, uh, and, and all of a sudden you're reading and you've read about two pages. You know, you're reading, this is good, this is good. And all of a sudden you're reading, you go, what did I just read? You ever do that? I do that a lot. I mean, I could not tell you the last three pages what I read. So I'll go back, go back, 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 back. Okay, I remember that was good and I remember that and go back and read it again. Sometimes that's what it takes me. It takes me twice as long than the average person to read a book because I have this great mind that can, can float, go different. I've already told you about sometimes when I'm talking to somebody and there's somebody else over here talking, my mind is going over here and I'm looking at you talking, but sometimes I hear you talking, but I'm not listening and it's not on purpose. I just get distracted by what they're saying because I want to know what, what they're talking about too because it sounds pretty interesting. Listen to what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah took God's word in. He didn't just read it, he didn't just hear it. It became a joy to him, it became a, <clears throat> became a delight to him. <clears throat> now I talk about my throat and there it goes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Watch this, <clears throat> talking about getting the right information, the right intel. <clears throat> Somebody says, you got that cup up there, drink something. Thank you, I heard that. <clears throat> I honestly think that this is what's making me <clears throat> do it. It's hot tea, but I put a lot of honey in it. And I think it's the sugar, isn't it? <clears throat> is that right, Dan? You're a diet expert, okay. Ab Dan said, absolutely. So I guess I had to drink bland hot tea when I come up here. <clears throat> Praise God. But listen to this. <clears throat> talking, about, talking about getting the right information. Again, what's God saying about your situation in your family? What's God saying about your, the information about your future? God's always talking. Are we receiving the intel? Are we receiving the knowledge, again, that God's putting out? Uh, you may recall of a story about a man named Gideon in the Bible, in Judges chapter six is where we first kind of get introduced to him. And um, a lot of us can identify with, with Gideon. 
uh, some of the points about Gideon's th- the story here is uh, Israel once again had walked away from God, had rebelled against God, had gone after other things, other gods, and God allowed their enemies to oppress them. And then once again, they cry out to God. And now God speaks to a man named Gideon. And he calls him, he calls Gideon, he says, you're a mighty warrior. And he's threshing, he's doing some wheat, threshing the wheat in a secret place where nobody can get him. He's kind of, you know, fearful kind of a guy. And listen to what it says. God calls him a mighty warrior. And here's what Gideon says. And he said to him, oh Lord, how, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh and I am the youngest in my father's house. I come from the lowest of people. I'm from the little town of Burlington and I be, we got this poor little family here in Burlington. How can we, God, how can I do anything? You ever had that kind of a feeling where we, God, there's something that you believe God wants you to do but we just, man, we're just, who are we? You know, I'm just, I'm just some ordinary, some average, average guy. But again, God wanted Gideon to see himself like God saw him, not like Gideon saw himself or not like the other people may have seen Gideon. He wanted Gideon to see himself not as a victim, but as a victor. <clears throat> you ever been in a, in a brainstorming meeting with maybe in your work, you maybe you work in a, in a group of people and you're brainstorming or in a church setting, you know, where you're casting vision and we're talking about vision and one, wanting to do things. And there's always someone that seems to poo-poo what everything wants to, everybody wants to do. I mean, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do that. No, we're not doing this. And you, ever, you ever been around those people? They just, they just had this Gideon kind of a mentality. You know, Moses had a little bit of that, that thing as well. But again, again, God wants to, when God wants to appoint you, God's not calling you. He's not appointing you for who you are, but who he sees you as. Amen. You think of all the people that Jesus chose as his disciples. Again, he didn't go to the seminary there in Jerusalem and pick out the four-year graduates there. He, yeah, the, 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 the uneducated, the unlearned men, these fishermen who were, who were, you know, but they were known, it says, to have been with Jesus. There's a couple other, there's a couple other uh, things that I want to talk about. And again, I'm going to save those for the week after Mother's Day about that helps us to get positioning. So these things today, getting the right atmosphere, having the right energy source, uh, and having the right knowledge, the right intel, these things have great parts to play in us walking in a blessed life. Where I want to go, I want to talk about being in the right place. That's important to be where God wants you to be. And it's also huge is this being around the right people people are huge to the blessings to be in creating that environment again where God can work amen let's all stand